Welcome back folks. I hope you're having a great holiday. This video here is part two of our look at the Hantec 6074 USB oscilloscope. Uh, if you haven't seen part one, uh, you're going to need to do that because this video is not going to make any sense unless you do. So I'm going to leave a card up above and uh, a link in the description below to that video. So we're just going to carry on from where we left off. So let's get right to it. We can also look at this from a perspective of rise time. We can have a look by using this here. I have this um, fast rise time oscillator here. This, this thing has got a, a, a rise time in and around about uh, 39 nanoseconds, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so there we've got it set up with the fast rise time oscillator, 50 ohm load, and we've got a rise time here. We're measuring at 1.6 nanoseconds. Now, as I pointed out before, when we did, we were doing the sweep, the frequency sweep, we saw that it actually the frequency kind of rose up and then came back down again as we approached the limit of it. And that's done, as I say before, to maximize the bandwidth. So this is not what you would call a, a Gaussian response on this. It's got a, a, a maximized response. So you divide 0.45 by the rise time and that should give you the frequency response. Now we tested the frequency response out to 260 megahertz before. So during that calculation, we get about 270 megahertz of bandwidth. So we verified that this thing will approximate that kind of bandwidth, both by doing a sweep and by doing the, the fast rise time. All right, so we've had a good look at the, the bandwidth of this thing. Now I, I do feel that user interface is not perfect. I mean, it, it is a little bit Fudgy to work with. I think they could really improve that a little bit more, but it is workable. I mean, like you, you can get around it. You can do the things that you need to do with it. It's got, it's got a lot of nice features. It's got triggering. It's various triggering. It's got math functions. It's got auto setup. It's got cursors. Let me show you the cursors. I don't think I'll show you those. Cursor, source channel one, type. Let's do a cross here. It's Put it there or there. Let's see if we can get uh, something similar to what the uh, book itself is giving us a rise time. Yeah, yeah, 1.57 nanoseconds. It did pretty close to what they're saying there. So that's how the crosshair cursor works. I believe it's just got uh, strictly horizontal and vertical cursors. And you, you can put the waveform in dots or you can have it solid in vectors. And, and all the usual things are here. So everything you really need, like a single shot mode is here too. Pause it, have a look at waveform here. So you can move the trace around after you've captured what you needed to capture. Okay, so let's have a look inside it. Let me, uh, let me take it apart a little bit and we'll have a look and see uh, how well this thing is built. Have a look at some of the parts in it. Pull the buggy ends off it. Buggy bumpers. Ooh. And I think it's going to be just like that other scope there. If we take off uh, one of these cover plates, the rest of it should just pop right out. go let me have a, a look at some of these chips to see if I uh, can identify them but in the meantime let me open this can here see what one of the front ends looks like you know this does actually have individual shielding over the input channels whereas that uh, other scope didn't okay so that looks pretty good. That looks pretty tidy. A couple of relays in there. Let me see if I can identify a couple of these chips. So, this has got AD written on it, but it doesn't have a part number. And this has the part number scraped off. So I can identify these. These look like MOSFETs here. 
Of course, these are relays, and uh, I'm not too sure what that is. But okay, let's have a look at the, the main chips here, see what we can identify here. Well, this is a Spartan processor here. That's doing the, the heavy lifting. Let's have a look at these three. Okay, this device here, this is a analog device, is HMCAD1511. And it's a high speed uh, multi mode 8 bit 30 mega samples per second to 1 giga sample per second AD converter. And uh, single channel mode, it's uh, a giga samples per second. Two channel mode, it's 500 mega samples per second. And uh, four channel mode, 250 mega samples per second. So that's why at four channel mode, you get 70 megahertz. At two channels, you get 150 megahertz, and one channel, you're getting 260 megahertz, as we saw. And uh, let's uh, let me see if I can see what that is. So it looks like uh, this is a system clock. It's a it's an ADF4360 integrated synthesizer and VCO. This here is a, a CY7C68013A uh, by Infineon Technologies, and it is a USB controller, microcontroller. Um, this is Spartan 6, it's the main processor. And in the back here, we have uh, 74HC595 uh, shift registers. These are probably for all controlling all the functions within the, the front end here. And these are a couple of uh, 74 series uh, data latches. And over here is the power supply. See also here we've got these little trimmer caps. Probably don't want to play around with them too much unless you necessarily have to. But that's it. I mean, that's that's the scope. Now, I know Handtech uh, have a, you know, they don't have a great reputation, unfortunately. And I think mostly that's due to their their desktop or benchtop scopes. And uh, there's in the same series, this is a thing called the 6022BE, which is uh, it's not quite as bad a piece of junk as that Andrew Star, but it's certainly not uh, up to the specifications that this is. I mean, this is, this is a real USB scope with real parts in it. And, uh, you know, it's being let down a little bit by the software and a little bit by the reputation of the company. But honestly, I wouldn't hesitate if you have, uh, you know, a couple of hundred dollars, yeah, like I say in the States, probably 160 bucks or 150 bucks. And that's all you have and you need a four channel scope and you need the ability to go out beyond 250 megahertz. I think this is an excellent way to go. I mean, you, you, you literally cannot get that from the premium makers like even Siglent and Rigol to get a 250 megahertz scope. You're going to be paying a lot more money than that. Um, and it's something that you know you can keep as a second scope. It's portable. I've used it a lot of times in portable mode. I've used it to look at power supplies by plugging it into a laptop and running it off the battery. It's totally isolated, so you, you get rid of all that common mode noise. So it's, it's, it's good for that. And I might just pull it out for that in the future. I know the recent videos that I've done on power supplies, I haven't bothered to do that. But uh, this is a, is a good way to get rid of all that feedback that goes down through the scope cable when you look at switch mode power supplies um, because these, it's not ground reference when you plug it into a, a, a laptop running off a battery. If you want to get a scope like this, they're, I think they're a great value. And uh, don't be put off by the name Handtech when it comes to buying something like this. Now this does have a big brother. It has the 6254, which is also four channel. And it's 250 megahertz rated throughout. So I I don't know how they manage that. Possibly maybe they have uh, four of these or two of these or, or a better, an upscale um, analog to digital converter. But uh, I would put that in the same category as this. I don't have any first-hand experience with it, but I have never heard anybody complain about it. However, that is getting up to the price of a, a good bench oscilloscope. I think it pushes around about $400. But this again, I mean, only it's only twice the price of that into star thing, but it's 10 times the oscilloscope. Continue to have a great holiday, guys. We'll see you probably in the new year. And um, in the meantime, do some electronics. Bye-bye.